Father, I ask for these blessings and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. seems we are having a double Dwayne. So uh, let's prepare our spirit. Yes. day and with each passing moment strength I find to meet my trials here trusting in my father's wise bestowments I've no cause for worry or for fear whose heart is kind beyond all measures give unto each day what he deems best lovingly each part of pain and pleasure mingling toils with peace and rest. Every day the Lord himself is near me with a special mercy for each child. All my cares he faint would bear and cheer me. He's whose name is Counselor and Power. The protection of his child in measure is a charge that on himself he laid. As the day your strength shall be in measure, this the pledge to me. Thy promises, O oh Lord, that I lose not fate, sweet consolation offered me within thy holy word. Help me, Lord, when trolls and troubles me. to take as from my father's hand one by one the day the moments fleeting till I reach the promised land Now we, will, now we will be reading the scripture reading found in Genesis 136. I'm sorry, 31. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day.
Happy Sabbath once more. I'm just going to remove this from here. I don't usually move too much, but uh, just in case. I hope your spirit is really ready for our message today. I do believe it's a very important topic and a very important message. Um, I think as ministers, our job is to, all, all members, but especially ministers, our job is to um, help us all being uh, attentive to the things that are going on in the world, to the things that are happening, and that we can be ready. We are supposed to blow the trumpet, all of us, and in a special way if we are set in ministry. So I would like us to reflect, as we don't have the uh, way to do it from here, the media team is going to help me. For me not to be always telling you to move, when I do like this, it's a sign. It, it looks just like we were using the remote, although it's not. We just mention about this text about the sixth day of creation. And uh, in case you didn't know, the sixth day is the day before the seventh. And you might think, Pastor, it's a little bit basic, but this is exactly, sometimes we might lose touch with simple and basic things. And we were seeing that God saw everything that he had made all up to the sixth day. And he said it was very good. Not only good. He keeps saying good, good, good all throughout the creation. But when he comes to the sixth day, he creates mankind. And he says it was very good. And then we entered the seventh day. The seventh day has inspired our church in a way that uh, it has our name. We are Seventh-day Adventists. Name usually refers to identity and mission. You see, Jacob had a name that had an attachment to his identity as a liar. And then when his life was touched by the Holy Spirit, his name was changed because his identity had changed. Abram had change, a change of name. Several characters in the Bible, they have a change of name. And also Jesus uses several names depending on the mission he is performing. When he comes to save is Jesus, that comes from the verb Yeshua, who he who saves, a word that comes uh, from that verb. And then he comes as Michael because he's the general. He comes with several names. Sometimes he even comes as the angel of the Lord. So the name defines our identity and our mission. And our name clearly defines that. And you know the process through which we were inspired as a church to receive this name. We are Seventh-day Adventists because we focus on the final events that will finish or culminate with the second coming, the advent, the second advent. And this is comprising all the prophecies that are related to that and to the final events. And we have seventh day because we focus on the seventh day of the week, Saturday, as commonly said, as the Sabbath rest. This defines an identity that is quite different from the other churches. We also talk about the three angel messages, a message in Revelation 14 that is really calling the world and has to do with our mission, calling the world for a final summon not with the global trends of the worldly attires, but with the trends that have to do with the Lord's call, with the beginning of creation. If you realize this is putting everything back again to the sixth day, because the reason why we worship the seventh day is because God is the God of the other six days who created everything. So you see, there's a great connection. In fact, there is a reason for us to have 24 hours in a day. It's the time the earth takes to go around herself. 
30, 365 e days in a year, roughly, is the time that the Earth takes to go around the Sun. But there's no other reason to have six to seven days on the week except the fact that God created it. In fact, the French, they tried to have a 14-week period and it didn't work. They noticed that their employees needed time to rest, to refresh after six days on a seventh day. So we are seeing that this is our identity and our mission to take the message of the Lord and His second coming, His return and His first coming to save and to acknowledge Him not only as Savior but as Lord. When the Bible is telling us that He's the Lord of the Sabbath, it is also trying to emphasize to us He is the Lord, period. Because the Sabbath is the ending of the power of His creation. He is the Lord who created. No one else can create. But how do you combine those two things? How do you combine final events and the Sabbath? As Adventists, we believe that in the culminating of the final events, a moment will come where laws will be issued to restrain our freedom, religious freedom, and we will be going into a period of great trial that is called uh, a time of trouble like never before, and that will precede exactly the coming of the Lord. We also believe that in this period, our freedom to worship in the day that the Lord gave us to worship will be restrained, and that will be um, called like a Sunday law. We call it a Sunday law. There's a lot to say about this, and sometimes the way it's put, it makes people confused, and it looks like we are into conspiracy theory. But yes, we will be into conspiracy with not too much theory. It will be practical and real. But sometimes we might get distracted. And this is why I would like to call our attention to have us alert today. Because many of us are following many times the wrong high priest. We think that we are prepared for Sunday law if we know exactly what the Pope is doing at every moment in time. Where is he going? But we are the people that will follow the Lamb wherever he goeth. Not follow the other trends. Our agenda is not defined by other leaders, but by Jesus. His path on the sanctuary is telling us exactly where he is and exactly in what time we are in history and what's the next thing. So we know that in 1844 he passed to the most holy place to minister in a very special way as a special reviewing of the people in the judgment started. And it's called the day of the Lord, the day the Lord will repay to each one according to their choices, to what they have decided to accept. Another thing that might get us distracted is Sunday law itself. Many Adventists are putting the emphasis on this event for them to make great decisions in their lives. Some of them think that their time to start being real Christians is when the latter rain comes or when the Sunday law comes or they have to be watched out until the close of probation. But until then, they can be distracted. This is one extreme. On the other hand, we have some people that all their life surrounds or spins around, circles around Sunday law. And sometimes we have the tendency also to look at the Sunday law with the wrong perspective. You see, Sunday law is not something to dread. It's in fact a great opportunity to witness that even we have been serving the Lord, but even if death is needed, we are okay. The same spirit that was with Daniel and his friends, in fact, the three friends of Daniel, when they say, Lord, uh, uh, King, you don't need to give us another chance. If the Lord wants to save us, He will. If He doesn't want to save us, we will still not worship the, the statue. We will still not do that. He mm -hmm. is the only one we worship. So we have to understand and put some things in perspective, and that's why I'm bringing this point. 
We see in the statue of Daniel 2, the superpowers. And it's telling us, this statue is telling us that at each time we have superpowers and they are used by the enemy to, pro, for, to do propaganda to his doctrines, to his beliefs, and to what he wants to bring to the world. And we see that the last superpower will also be bringing the same kind of things that drink from the statue system. So we have all the kingdoms. We have Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, uh, religious Rome, then the mixing kingdoms of Europe that will go, I'm sorry, this is in Spanish, uh, will go to uh, the New World. That's just very easy to understand also. To the New World. And we see that the system of food is copying from Babylon and the challenges that Daniel and his friends had to go through. The system of entertainment is copying from uh, Greece and Rome. The system of sports is copying. And all those things are now in our devices and multimedia. That's why we are seeing those things with the youth and having them understanding what is really going on. And it's good also for the parents to understand that. But what I want us to realize today is how does this makes a parallel because what we are saying and what the Lord is trying to show us is that every time we have a superpower, Satan will try to use that superpower to propagand his doctrines and God will send his people there to witness. So you see, Egypt, the Lord wanted to reach Egypt with a health message with a message of power. He sent Joseph there and the Israelites, once the Israelites were not evangelizing them. Then God wanted to reach Babylon. And so Israelites went in captivity to all these nations, Babylon, then Medo-Persia, and then the Lord switched the table. And now instead of them going there, the Lord brought them to Israel. So the Greeks conquered Israel, then the Romans took over the Greeks and took over Israel. I want you to realize that the same thing is happening today. You see, we had a time that our church was going out for mission and preaching to the world, and then it vanished. We lost sense of this, and now immigration is bringing all the other nations to us. We can and we have the chance to worship the Lord and share and witness and take the message to Muslims, to Jews, to all kind of religions, Hindus, all of them you find them in America and they are all in contact with their home places. In fact, many of them are more receptive here with a clash of cultures than they will be in their places. I want you to realize that after the Lord gave the chance for the Jews to go to the nations and they didn't finish the job, then the Lord gave them the chance for the nations to come to them and they didn't finish the job and then the clash was coming and persecutions came and all these problems and troubles. If we don't do it in a time of ease, we will have to do it in a time of trouble. And I don't mean by this, the final time of trouble because when we get to the end of that, many of the things that we could have done will not be done. But after Sunday law and all these restrainments, we can already be in some trouble to take the message. But what I want to emphasize today is that God always sent His people there as He sent Daniel to Babylon. Modern Babylon is the system that we are seeing today and the superpower of the moment is Satan is trying to use it. So in modern Babylon, God raised the church right in the country where it will happen all the systems of the last superpower so that we could face the system of modern Babylon. Of course, I'm not saying Babylon is the United States, and I'm not saying that the United States is part of uh, uh, the devil, and I want to clarify that very easily. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was converted. The kings from Persia also were taken by the gospel, and in the U.S. we find a nation that has been for years speaking as a lamb and reaching the world with Christianity. What I'm saying is that superpowers are used by Satan to try to propaganda, to do propaganda to the things. And if you see the way we eat here has reached the world, copying the model of Babylon. The, the way we get entertainment, movies, music, all of this is now in the world. 
And that's why God raised this church here. So that we could bring the health message to those that are engaged in fast food and other systems of food. So that we can bring all this kind of message for revival. I want to call your attention to some aspects here. Sunday Law has a great parallel to the book of Daniel. What happened in the plain of Dura is a clear parallel of what will happen in the last days when Sunday Law comes. In the book of Daniel we have an image of a statue. It was supposed to be with several metals, but Nebuchadnezzar said, no, it's going to be all Babylon. This kingdom is not going to end. This is me in control. In Revelation 13, we have a beast, and an image of the beast is built. In Revelation and in Daniel, we have the same parallel. In Daniel, the statue is 600 cubits by 6 and 6, and, or 60 by 6, or 60-60. And we can, it depends on the measurements you take, but the numbers are referring to manhood, not to godlyhood. 777 will represent the Godhead, 666 will represent this. And we know in Revelation 13, 18, we have also the number of a man, manlyhood. Babylon was trying to emphasize man, like it comes from Babel, where they challenged God and wanted to build themselves a name and a reputation. Then... We have in Babylon, in Daniel, the king calls all the great, all the great men of the world. We have in Revelation, the prostitute is making commerce with all the kings of the earth. We have in Daniel that they are challenging God. Nebuchadnezzar is challenging God. We have in Revelation that uh, God is being blasphemed by this power. But now it comes to a more specific thing. There's a death penalty both in Daniel 3, 6 and in Revelation 13, 15. A death penalty to all of those who don't bow to the statue, who don't worship the statue. There's a need to st worship the statue or the beast. And the Lord warns us in the three angel messages, there's a woe for those who bow to this. And so as Christians that are Seventh-day Adventists, we've been trying to be faithful because we believe that we should stand for this. I would like to call your attention, though, because the devil also studied prophecy. The devil is also looking at things, and he's not stupid. So we cannot just play smart and think just, just because we have information about what is coming that the devil will not have ways to get to us because it says there that he will work in such a way that if possible will fool even the elect. So today I would like to call your attention because I use this uh, as the milk theory. You know, if you have watched milk that is boiling, whether it is uh, dairy milk, but even soy milk, and, uh, it's amazing that it, it behaves the same way. You may be watching the milk as long as you want. When you look to the side, the milk goes in right away. One fraction of this traction, and here spills. So sometimes by trying to be concentrated, we started getting distracted in the method we use to concentrate. And this is exactly what I would like to talk to us today. I would like for that that we will pay attention to the reasons why we keep the seventh day and why it's important. You see, the seventh day, it says, and I have some words in bold, it says that the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day. Some people say God created rest and worship on the resting day. From all his work, which he has made, and God Blessed the seventh day. So the what is the opposite of blessing? Cursing. And God sanctify it. What is sanctifying meaning? Set aside, separate, make different, make special. What is the opposite of that? Turn all the table around. Because that in the in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. This is the reason why we keep the Sabbath. And if you go to Revelation 14, it's saying 
that, that we should worship he who created everything and not the other system and not the beast. So this is what we stand for as a church. But I would like to call your attention to the sixth day and to notice some very interesting details here. In the sixth day, God made all the beasts of the earth. Look at the detail. I always ask myself why God says things with so many details. It looks so rep repetitive. And we know that uh, somehow the Hebrews, they have the tendency to, to repeat. But look at this. Make them after his kind or their kind and cattle after their kind. But then he goes and says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. And you say, yeah, well, we could get there, male and female. I think you didn't need to explain that. You didn't need to explain that the animals were after their kind. But that's us. But God is God, and he knows the future even before it happens. And he thought it will be important to remark this in the relation of creation. And he said that God saw everything that he had made, and it was very good on the sixth day. So if something is very good, it's not only good, it's very good, why do you need to try to put it even better? Can you put it even better? Or when you do that, you're probably making it worse. And now I come to my point on what I want to share with you today. I need to use this, otherwise they might be confused as I move so much. Look, we have the sixth day and the seventh day. On the seventh day, God ended his work and rested and blessed and sanctified the day. That's the seventh day. On the sixth day, God made the beasts of the earth and cattle after their kind. God created man on his own image, male and female. God saw everything that he had made and he was very good. I want you to understand this. Satan goes in the process of counterfeit to God. Whatever God has been doing, he will counterfeit. He will mimic. Before the true revival, you will have false revival. Before the second coming, you will have a false second coming. He always does that before because when we compare it to the real thing, we have no doubt that it's false. But he goes, it follows and mimics the process of God. So what I want you to realize is that before creating the seventh day, God created all the structure for that day. He couldn't have rested before he had worked, although he didn't need to rest. So the same way, before attacking the seventh day, Satan will attack the sixth day. Because the sixth day makes preparation for the seventh day. And I want you to realize something very interesting. You see, 1844 was the beginning of the end time. God will start his judgment, will start emphasizing the seventh period of the church. The period that was supposed to emphasize what is in the most holy place, the law and the Sabbath. So Satan started right away bringing the theory of evolution. God on the sixth day says that he created after their kind and man to his image. So Satan is now putting that in doubt, saying that they were created after our image. Summarizing, he's saying that email animals are the image of God. He's calling God an animal. Because if we were created to his image and animals are created to our image or we are the image of animals, this is a very direct, indirect way to curse God. Also, is a way to deny what God is saying. Is a way to deny that He created it. Is a way to deny that he, they, he created them after their kind. But then the following thing is that it says that God created the mankind, male and female. So Satan attacks the mankind, and now he's attacking how God structures things. You see, God created male and female. He's now creating a great uh, disruption from this. And I know this is a topic that we have to be nowadays very careful to talk about, but I don't think it should be a taboo. 
because exactly the movement that is behind this topic, they are against any taboos, against the fact that you cannot talk about anything. So I want us to understand that real tolerance is not when I shut you up. There's no tolerance. And Satan goes to extremes. On one hand, we have chauvinism. And then people start thinking that the solution for chauvinism is feminism. But this is just the other extreme. The solution is the balance between the two extremes. On the same way, we find Satan showing, and he always creates this in the movies you see, before a revolution starts, they ground that revolution. You see, before we have an adultery, we will see that this man is unfair, this woman is unhappy, and this neighbor is giving her attention to justify that now this adultery will happen because she didn't deserve that treatment. It was wrong, but the guy was deserving it. And we see also in movies about racism. First, all the black people are being beaten up. We have to see all those details and all those images so that it justifies that now we do all the things that we're going to do. Satan will usually all work like this. And he's doing the same thing for years. He was taking advantage of many Christians that were not understanding the sense of Christianity. And they were hating homosexuals. God never called us to hate homosexuals, to curse them, or to tell them any bad things or offend them. Those were not real Christians that gave us a bad reputation. And we were called to call all sins as being badly. And if that's something that is not happy or not making you happy and not creating the way that God wanted you to go will not make you happy, we were supposed to call attention to that. God loves the sinners and not sin. And I know some people will try to argue if it's a sin or not a sin. I want to clarify that. We are not using sin in the context that the Middle Ages mentality will put it. That you can decide what is sin or not. And it's up to us as the church to say. Sin is defined by God. It's defined by the character of God. Anything that opposes to what God creates and the structure He has is sin. As a designer, I understand this very well. If I design something to be used in a certain way, I spend hours designing it, and you go and use it in a different way that is disrupting what I created, this is an offense. You're cursing all the time I spent it in, in studying. You can eat soup with a, with a fork. It was just not designed for that. So it will not work. And many of the things we do, when people ask me, oh, so you're against homosexuality? First, I clarify, I don't have any prejudice. I reasoned about it and came to conclusions. And then I explain that I do believe that many people are trying to find their way to happiness. And I do believe that the best way to be happy is to go to the one that produced this product and see exactly how it was designed to. And I don't think that using the product in a way that it was not designed to will make the product work well and bring happiness. It's very simple. But what I want to emphasize here is, now we came from one extreme. Yes, a lot of uh, people were oppressed because of their sexual orientation. And I want to make it very clear. Sometimes as Christians, we take their freedom away. People are free to marry whoever they want. You are also free to do whatever you want with your life. But then at the end, the owner of everything will come and call you to an accountant and see if you made good choices or not good choices. This happens in school, this happens at work, this happens everywhere. Why shouldn't God have the right to do that at the end? We want to give everybody the right. People say, I have the right to do whatever I want. So does God. Let him be free and do whatever he wants. And now let's see who's more powerful. So that part we don't like. Okay, so it's like I am okay and I can do whatever I want. Then do it with your own creation not come and disrupt somebody else's world. Go and create your own world. Of course, they deny that God will be there. And this is where all the rubber meets the road. And that's why God will have to prove his point and say, hey, you may believe whatever you want, but this is still mine. And this is the same thing if somebody comes to my house. They may believe whatever they want is still my house, right? So what I want to emphasize here is how all the things are tied in a sequence. You see, first the attack to the uh, way men were created, and now this attack. And I want you to also realize this. So Satan is polarizing things. Now because 
homosexuals were oppressed in the past, that should give them the right to oppress anyone because they think differently. So if you are fighting for your freedom, is this the best way to fight for your freedom? By denying the freedom of others? Some people, they curse Jesus and they are free to say whatever. And we cannot say anything as Christians because it's freedom of speech. So you can curse God, but you cannot say anything against somebody else's option of life and say, I agree or I disagree. I don't think this is even our constitution. I don't think this is even the right that we have given as a nation. Of course, we, I don't believe anybody should have the right to offend people. Offending people is not expressing a different opinion. Offending people is going against them and offending the way they are because of what they are. And this is not what we should do as a Christian. But I want you to realize that all this is trying to disrupt God's image. A man represents Jesus, a woman represents Christ. So now we have a man that is in love. Christ is in love by himself. The church is in love by herself. So we are disrupting the gospel. I want you to realize that the goal here is to prepare the way for the seventh day. What I've called several times the avenues to the Sunday law. We have a process. If you see Daniel and his friends, and um, I want us to realize this, a lot of people are talking, for instance, I received this image like showing Daniel and his friends being faithful and not bowing to the vaccines. I only have one problem with this image because this is a misunderstanding of a process. You see, I want us to understand something. There's a process. First, there was an attack on appetite. This is the physical dimension. Daniel had a health challenge before he had a spiritual challenge so if we want to put vaccines in some field we have to put it in the health field not in the spiritual field we cannot mix up and consider this is sunday law in the sense that daniel when he was tempted with the food of the king that was not the ultimate decree daniel was still in one test and the lord will use some tests to prepare the way for the final test and Satan will use some ways to prepare the way for the final way. So we see that this is a pattern all throughout the Bible and even in the sanctuary. We had Eve being tempted physically, then tempted mentally when Satan started questioning what God said and saying that she could be like God. She went to the spiritual realm. We see Daniel, first he was tempted with the table of the king. Then he was tempted to think he was the only one that could interpret dreams. Then his friends were tempted to bow to the statue. We saw Jesus, he was tempted to turn the bread into, uh, the, the, the stones into bread. Then he was tempted to think he was the son of God, he could do whatever and jump from the pinnacle. Then he was tempted to bow. So if there's any challenging happening, the challenging is not happening still on the spiritual realm, but on the physical realm. We are talking about the health. Before the image is formed, there's a process. Before the statue was formed, there was a process. I want us also to realize that before the seventh day attack comes, the six days will come. Health is something of the sixth day. God gave us a body. God gave us health. God gave us a temple to take care of. So if there's a challenging happening, we cannot at any mode put it already as a spiritual challenge for adoration. It could be a spiritual challenge for health. Are you with me? So I want us to understand something very important. And this is that the Bible tells us to be sober and be vigilant because our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. We already shared this, how lions attack. Lions attack like this. The lioness comes roaring in one way and all the herd get scared and start running and scattering all over the place and they go towards the other direction where the real lion hunters are waiting. So this roaring here is just a distraction maneuver to get the herd running to the other way. 
If the Bible tells us that Satan attacks like a lion, we should see how lion attacks to see how Satan is attacking. And Satan will attack by creating roaring distraction maneuvers in one hand and having God's people getting scattered and running to the other hand, thinking they are attentive to what is coming next. I want us to understand that the challenge at the table was a real challenge, but was not the real ordeal. The real thing was to come along the way. I want us to understand that the challenges of the sixth day are also a real ordeal, but they are not the real thing that will come as the final challenge. And if we get distracted with those maneuvers, we will not make it. As I've said before, I wonder if Satan is not thinking about giving up on Sunday law. Because all these problems with vaccines and virus, and this has created such a division that probably doesn't even have to worry about Sunday law. We will probably not make it there in unity. But I want us to understand that this is in fact not the final ordeal. He will strike really hard. This is the maneuver of the sixth day before he strikes with the seventh day. He is striking not only on the health of the people on the way he thinks are restrained, but he is striking specially on the unity of the body. Interesting, God called the church the body. Before the strikes on the head, which is Sunday law, there will be a strike on the body, which is the sixth day. So we are suffering at this moment a strike on the sixth day, and I want us to realize that all this is part of a scenario. I want us to realize that, as again, I summarize what I said. First, the food challenge, then the pride, and then the spiritual challenge. It's funny because you can see a clear counterfeit. Before, we would proudfully, in a good way, or humbly if you want, state that we had this symbol that God is still in control and all that was happening before the flood, He was the boss. And still He was a merciful boss. He gave us a promise. And Satan is trying to attack exactly that. You see, the Bible tells us that in the last day, it will be like the days of the flood. So what we are seeing is the same spirit in reverse. We had all the rebelliousness, then the flood, then the symbol. Now we are having the symbol and the rebelliousness that will go to a great flood and a great final thing that will not be by water. I want us to understand how serious this moment is is I want to ask you something do you think if Daniel and his friends didn't make it to the first temptation they will make it to the last one do you think that if Jesus didn't make it to the first temptation he will make it to the last one so I tell you straight from the Bible that if we don't make it to the first challenge we will not make it to the last one if we are not watchful enough to resist the challenge and the counterfeit of the sixth day, we will not be strong enough to resist the challenge of the seventh day. I want us to understand that the way of God to fight, even with Satan, is a humble way. We find many times in the Bible that it says that he didn't dare to say any curse against him, but he said, the Lord may rebuke you O Satan so it is not our job to go against people because they have beliefs that we biblically know they are not correct or they are making decisions that we don't think are aligned with inspiration our job is to stand and witness you see when Daniel was being framed he didn't go to the king and to the guys and say I know you guys are framing me and I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. You see, he didn't go there. He just kept doing his own thing, witnessing his own way, and it was very clear. And even when he went to the lion's den, he came out of that in a way that was even more clear, that he had a more powerful God, and he was right with what he was saying. I want us to understand 
what Satan does, because this is very important. When Satan strikes on us with the first temptation, which is appetite, if we resist, he will strike on us with the second temptation, which is presumption. Whatever way we go with this, that will make us fall on the third one. If we have resisted or taken good decisions concerning our health, whether it is the kind of food we eat, whether it is if we are taking or not vaccines, whether it is the way we face the challenge of a pandemic, that should not make us fall on the second temptation of presumption and think that just because of that we are better or our decision is better or our ways are better. We should clearly see what Satan is trying to do. And you know, there's only one way for the church to face this, is to be united in Christ. The Spirit of Prophecy says that Christ in me will identify with Christ in you. And this is how we know we are of Christ, if we have Christ's Spirit. I want you to understand, it's not if we have Christ's doctrine, because even Satan can have control on prophecy and know prophecy better than us and know everything, but it doesn't subdue to Christ's spirit. So I would like us to really understand what we are seeing going on and to know if we are ready. We are told that the country will be going to a way where basic rights of freedom will be denied. If we are not ready to face basic rights of freedom denied now, how are you going to face them later? I want us to understand where exactly we are. The seventh day strike didn't come yet, but the sixth day test must be passed for us to make it for the seventh day challenge. And this is why I would like to live to leave this message to our church that we may understand the Lord gives us minor challenges and tests to prepare us to the great one. We must first pass the test of health challenge, the test of presumption challenge for us to be able to pass the test of a law that will restrain all that we know about our God. I would invite you to be in a prayerful mode. Every day I receive information about families that are being destroyed. The Lord is trying to protect His own, but we are seeing terrible ways coming upon the marriages, coming upon the youth. A blindness is taking over. And this is where Satan wants us to be distracted. And this is where we need to be watchful for the milk not to spill. May the Lord help you as you reflect and meditate upon this. And to close, we will be having our closing song. We invite you to stand up for us to sing, The Church Has One Foundation. That's 348. This afternoon we will be talking about more of the ways that society is being polarized and disrupted and the church is being polarized and disrupted. And I invite you all to join us for the youth program this afternoon.
all those who can to kneel before the Lord for a final word of prayer. Beloved Father in heaven, I come before you at this moment. We are in times like never before, and we are on the verge of times like never seen. We need your discernment, your perception, but most of all, we need your spirit. We need your guidance, your empowerment to make the right decisions. This is a moment, Father, as a church, for us to come closer to you, for us to seek connection, unity with each other and with yourself. I pray, Father, that you may please open our eyes, our perception, to see things the way you want us to see, to see things the way you see them. I pray, Father, that you may preserve us as a church for the challenges that are ahead. I do believe in the deep of my heart that if we have seen some polarization in this nation and in this church, in the church in general, all over the world, until now with this pandemic, I do believe, Father, we will see even more. I do believe we are seeing the results of the roaring of the lion that is using maneuvers for distraction. And unfortunately, we are running asunder and scattering when in fact, if the herd will stick together with you, we could resist. I pray, Father, that your mercy will work upon us because I do believe that many of the shakings that come to us, you allow them because they will help us being refined and prepared for the final strike. I ask that your mercy may move upon us individually, that our hearts may be so identified with yours that we may be one in you. I ask for these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Wish you all a very happy Sabbath. Um, you're all invited to join us if you want for the second part of this day as we have fellowship together and then we will move for our afternoon program especially for the youth but I think for the responsibility all of us that are not that young should also participate and learn and again I encourage you to check on this book testimonies on sexual behavior I think it's uh, a very important book for the season. Happy Sabbath to all of you.